Sape satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta Hello, I'm Dave Jacobson, and welcome to the first episode of Nibbana, the secret treasure of the Buddhas. Today we're going to talk about non-conceptual Nibbana. What do I mean by non-conceptual? By that I mean Nibbana is not something experienced as a sign or symbol, but rather it is only possible to experience Nibbana in the symbol-less state of non-conceptuality. Well, what does that mean? That means words or symbols can never describe the absolute, can never describe the real truth, can never describe something like Nibbana. Of course, Nibbana isn't a thing. <laughs> and all of our words, all of our concepts are about things. At the most subtle level, our concepts are about other concepts. But Nibbana is not a concept. It's not even an idea. It's an experience, but it's an experience that is experienced without senses, without mind, without consciousness. That might be very difficult to understand. And actually, it can't be understood <laughs> because it's beyond the mind. What to do? How to talk about Nibbana in a way that makes sense? Well, the Buddha managed to communicate the idea of Nibbana quite successfully. He says, This is peaceful. This is excellent. The stilling of all fabrications, the relinquishment of all assets, the destruction of craving, detachment, cessation, Nibbana. And the Nibbana in that verse is often translated as extinction. And as we discussed last time, extinction means in the sense of extinguishing a fire, not in the sense of uh, a species becoming extinct or a person becoming extinct, but simply that the fuel is gone, the fire goes out. The fire is a condition, not a thing. Because as soon as the fire runs out of fuel, it's gone. Well, where did it go? It didn't go anywhere. It simply stopped being. Why? Because the cause of the fire, the fuel and the combustion, has ended. Therefore, the fire also ends. So, Nibbana is like that. We have a condition similar to a fire called being. In fact, this body is actually running on combustion of fuel, which is our food, our air. We take in oxygen, and oxygen combines with the food, and it creates energy, which is felt as heat, and the kinetic energy of the muscles and electrical energy in the nerves and so forth. So this body is a heat engine. It's a combustion. It's a fire. And we know, for example, if we get indigestion, sometimes the fire can get too hot. Or if we can't digest our food, sometimes the fire is too low. So in any case, as soon as the fuel is gone, as if we don't get any food or we don't get any air, then the fire goes out. The life stops. Death happens. Okay, so all these things are symptoms of a phenomenon, of a being. In fact, we often call the word is the verb to be. So to be is a condition that's dependent on prior causes. For example, birth. But as soon as we have birth, we also have decay and death. So Nibbana is beyond all of these things. Nibbana is peaceful. Why? Because it's the stilling of all fabrications. Everything that exists, everything that has being, is the result of a fabrication. What does that mean? A desire, an intention, a condition 
that creates the process leading to birth. So being, in that sense, is a process of causality, and this is called karma. Karma simply means cause and effect. So we know, it, for example, if someone is born, that their father and mother came together and created that life. And that was the cause, the physical cause, which is the immediate or efficient cause of their birth. But beyond that, the being themselves wanted that birth. There was a desire. There was a fabrication. Let me be born in the world. Let me attain being. Let me have existence. Let me have life. And this, of course, is a cause leading to birth, but it's also a cause leading to death. You can't separate the two. The death is born along with the birth, say the astrologers. And if you're sufficiently good at astrology, you can pretty much predict a person's lifespan from the situation at their birth. But that's another story. <laughs> We're talking about stopping birth, stopping death. And how is that done? By Nibbana. So, let's go on. Not only is Nibbana peaceful, it's excellent. Well, what does that mean? That means it's beautiful. It's the best thing. It's pure. It's wonderful. It's eternal. It has all good qualities, all good effects. There's nothing bad about Nibbana, <laughs> nothing dangerous or harmful about it. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't uh, compromise the real nature of ourselves. And when I say ourself in this context, I mean actually no self. No I. So, how is this possible? By the relinquishment of all assets. Okay, we have two diseases. I and mine. And the way we create this I is by establishing or identifying certain things as mine. We'll get into this in detail, or actually we have earlier in the series. Um, I think I'm going to repost that material so that everyone can get at it. But it's given in the Mula Pariyaya Sutta by the Buddha. He describes in detail the process of eye-making and mind-making. And I'll give you a pointer to that when we get to the appropriate place in the text. Now you should be reading along in the text. Uh, the PDF file that's referenced in the description of the video or in the blog post. The destruction of assets or relinquishment of all assets, this is also known as renunciation or detachment. It doesn't mean that we um, take everything we own and burn it. <laughs> it simply means that we give up the attachment to it. We give up thinking of it as mine. For example, I live in a community, and in this community, there are many things, many assets. This rug, this couch I'm sitting on, the house itself, the walls, everything. These are assets, but I don't think of them as mine. Just like when I was in the monastery before, I had my own place, a very nice stone hut in the mountains, very quiet, great for meditation. But even though I gave the money to build it, I didn't think of it as mine. And when I was done there, I walked away from it without a second thought. So what is this idea of mine anyway? If I say, no, oh, this pillow is mine. Huh? This is mine. <laughs> what does it mean? Is the pillow any different? Huh? Does it now have a big mine stamped on it? No. It's still the same pillow it was before. Nothing has changed except my view. I now view this pillow as mine. And if anybody tries to use it, <laughs> it's so ridiculous. If anybody tries to use this pillow, then we, we can fight over it. No, it's mine. No, I want to use it. No, it's mine. We even have laws and courts and all kinds of institutions and police and everything all to protect this idea of mine. 
pretty crazy if you ask me. But anyway, we have to relinquish these assets and stop the process of eye making and mind making because it's a tremendous burden. Just keeping it all straight. Which stuff is mine and which is the other person's? And, you know, when do I get to use the hot tub? And you know, all these questions of I and mine. They're really largely irrelevant to our everyday life. And it only comes up if there's some conflict. Isn't it? So anyway, when we let go of these things, we drop a huge burden. Suddenly life is so much easier without the constant need to fabricate I and mine. So most of what we experience in life is this fabrication, these concepts. I, mine, yours, theirs, ours. Oh boy, it's complicated. So what we're trying to do is actually the next item, the destruction of craving. Craving. Desire, need, want, must have. Huh? This is the cause of our suffering. This ignorance, thinking I want, I need, I must have. This desire, this is what causes all of our problems. Why is that? Because none of these things are really ours. Now, if they come to us, by the law of karma, that's fine. But if we have to like get up in the morning, rush through breakfast, jump in the car, go to some job far away that we don't really care about, just to earn money so we can have the, the fruits of our desires, huh? sit there in the traffic and honking horns and people yelling, <laughs> just to get to work and then to get to work and the boss is chastising or giving some orders. I remember one time I was at an office, a client's office, and the CEO came on the PA system and he says, I want everybody to forget about their families, forget about your girlfriend or boyfriend, forget about your private life, just work, work, work. <laughs> It was holiday season, and he was saying, we got to get the product out so we can make our numbers this year. So I want everybody to give up their private life and just work. Well, are you going to pay us anymore? No. Are you going to, like, even give us an award or shake our hand or something? No. No, it's just expected. And that's the way it is in the corporate world. And you subject yourself to 8, 10, 12, or more hours of that every day? Why? Just to have some things that you desire? It's kind of nuts if you ask me. So detachment, the detachment from I and mine that comes about from the stealing of fabrications, from the relinquishment of assets, from detachment from I and mine. This is wonderful. Huh? It's such a relief. Oh, I finally don't have to do all this stuff anymore just to keep up all my attachments. I'm not dependent on those things anymore. Because those dependencies become further causes of suffering. What happens if we lose the thing? What happens if it breaks? What happens if it just wears out? Then we suffer because we're attached. It's a mental suffering, dukkha. Uh, then the result of Nibbana is also cessation. Cessation of what? Cessation of becoming. Cessation of the process of attaining existence and being and manifestation in the world. Actually, this morning I had a vision, a very interesting vision. I saw how life passes constantly from future to present, to past, like a stream flowing downhill. Huh? The future is kind of hazy, um, kind of indefinite. There's all these possibilities. It's like a space of possibilities, some that might happen, some that may happen, some that won't happen. 
And then those gradually become denser and denser until they crystallize at the moment. Huh? Like, like the quantum wave function breaking down. We open the box and see if Schrodinger's cat is alive or dead. <laughs> the moment of experience, the moment of observation. Huh? At that moment we call the present. And then as the same experience fades into the past, it becomes a memory. It becomes a fossil. It's unchangeable. It's done. It's finished. It can never be altered. So the, the future is highly mutable, highly changeable. The present depends on how we look at it, how we experience it. But the past is fixed. The past is what it is. Or it is what it was. <laughs> and it's gone. We can never capture it again. So, in that way, things become more and more dense. If we want to look at the past, but what do we do? Like archaeologists, uh, we dig holes and we look and see what's buried there is the past. So, when we go down into the dense earth, we find the past. And when we look up in the sky, we see the future. And this is why astrology is relevant. But the present is happening right here, right at this level. We're alive now. And so what are we doing? We're eating food, which is like the future energy. And then it becomes the present energy as it digests in the fire of the body. And then it passes out and becomes the past. <laughs> Same thing is going on. This is the vortex, the whirlpool of samsara. The whirlpool spins around like that and it creates a suction that brings in all the debris and water floating around it and goes down into the bottom and then it gets scattered out again and it's gone. So this is samsara wandering on in this material world. So this verse is one of the 40 classic meditations that Buddhist monks learn. And it's one of the most potent, and this is why we're using it as kind of our theme for this series. I'll read it once again. This is peaceful. This is excellent. The stilling of all fabrications, the relinquishment of all assets, the destruction of craving, detachment, cessation, nibbana more meaningful now than the first time, huh? Yeah. So anyone who understands what we're talking about or what the Buddha is talking about in this verse is in a position to realize Nibbana for themselves. Nibbana is not something far away, far off, uh, that takes lifetimes and lifetimes to realize. No. That image, that that picture of Nibbana has been created artificially by the scholars. And we'll get into the history of how that occurred. But Nibbana is something right here and now. It can be realized by anyone. If you're alive, if you're conscious, if you're watching this video, you have what it takes to realize Nibbana. Everyone does. And it's our birthright. It's actually our right as a being to have relief from the symptoms of suffering and to be able to annihilate the cause of suffering and attain Nibbana for ourselves. Uh, I've had three or four students have wonderful experiences of Nibbana. A friend told me early this morning, I was on a chat with him, and we've been working together for a couple of years. And he told me, I woke up in the middle of the night, the other night, and I could see how I'm coming out of emptiness into manifestation and then going out again into emptiness at the end. Beautiful realization. That's Nibbana. He got a little taste of Nibbana. Maybe it's not complete and perfect realization like the Buddha, but 
it's definitely real. He has all the symptoms. He got goosebumps. He was in ecstasy. Uh, he was seeing all this. And then he said, and then I went back to sleep, and the next morning I forgot about it. <laughs> but two or three days later, I remembered that I had that experience. And this is what I call the nostalgia of enlightenment. <laughs> that sometimes an experience will happen. And it'll, it'll just happen spontaneously. Of course, actually, we've been creating it and creating the conditions for it for a long time. And then one day, boom, it hits us spontaneously. Ah. And afterwards, we look back on it. And it has a, a different flavor. It has, in some ways, an even more sweet flavor than it did in the moment, because some aspects of enlightenment are terrifying. He said, in fact, my friend said, it was wonderful and terrible at the same time. And he's been a Christian most of his life. So to see emptiness and to see how the self comes out of emptiness into manifestation and then goes back into emptiness again at the end was kind of scary for him. It is for a lot of people. My first taste of Nibbana was very scary. Emptiness, nothingness, wow, scary stuff. But it's only because we're clinging to the ego. If we're not clinging to the ego, it's no problem. The friction in enlightenment comes from our own attachment. So when my friend realized this, he was so attached that he had to forget it. His conscious mind had to throw it out. Couldn't take it. Couldn't explain it. Couldn't understand it. Ditch it. <laughs> but he remembered somehow or other, and in a few days, he was okay enough with it that it could surface in his mind again. And so, oh, yeah, I remember. Oh, that was beautiful, actually. Scary and awesome, but it was kind of wonderful, too. So these enlightenment experiences may happen, and we may not even be aware of what it is, because we don't have a category in our understanding, in our ontology, a category of experience that describes it. So that's why we're doing this education. That's why we have all these courses on our website, beginning with Matrix Learning and Foundation Series and so on, to gradually introduce the terminology and the categories of meaning that describe enlightenment. So you can recognize it when you have an experience like that, because everybody does, especially the experience of death. The experience of death is when we enter into emptiness, into nothingness. And if we're not ready for it, it can be rough, you know. We can be clinging and holding on to our attachments and only to have them ripped from our hands by time and karma. It's very painful, but if we're willing to just let go and go with the flow, it's not a problem anymore. And this is what an enlightened person experiences at the time of death. It's simply passing into emptiness, just like going into deep sleep at night. Another uh, verse that I want to uh, reference here in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, uh, there are six qualities of the Buddha's teaching. And these are svakata, well-proclaimed. The Buddha gave us a complete teaching. He's not holding anything back. There are no secret aspects. Even though I use secret in the title, I do so not because of the Buddha, but because of people who came after him who buried the Buddha's truths. And we'll see how that happened in later episodes. But the Buddha gave the complete teaching and he said, I have given it with an open hand. I'm not like some teachers that keep things back from their students. Uh, I give everything, everything you need to know. Uh, he says, actually, I've realized much, much more than just Nibbana, but you don't really need that right now. So it's not that I'm keeping it from you. You'll realize it yourself once you get this. And then he said, it's Sanditika. It can be realized in the here and now. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to become anything different than what you already are. 
you can realize it right here and now. In fact, that's the only place we can realize it is here and now. Not in the future, not in the past. All we have is the present. So if we're going to realize Nibbana, it's going to happen right here and now. And very importantly, it's Akalika, timeless. So it doesn't require future lives. It doesn't require anything more than what we've got to work with right here and now. Moving on, it's a pasika, inviting you to come and see for yourself. Huh? Come and see. Try this method. See what kind of result you get. If it's good, then stick with it. If it's not, let it go. This is the Buddha's instruction to the Kalamas. You try this. Anything that's been given by the wise people, you try it for yourself. Don't just believe it because somebody said so, even if I said so. But try it for yourself. If it works for you, that's great. Because the Buddha gave many, many methods. In fact, it's said he opened 80,000 Dharma doors. So 80,000 different methods. Holy cow. How can we even begin to sample all these different methods? Well, the most important of them are given in the suttas. And it is also opanayiko, leading one onwards to enlightenment, step by step. In other words, the Buddha's teaching doesn't say, I'll just go give up everything and attain enlightenment. That would be too hard. So instead, he begins step by step by step. Let go of attachments, uh, let go of desire, let go of lust. Begin slowly getting right view, the right understanding, and then the right livelihood and so on, leading up to right meditation. And if you get all these eight things, beginning with right view, then attaining enlightenment is actually very easy. Once you get to the meditation part, it doesn't take very long. If someone has been meditating more than two to five years and they still aren't satisfied by their realization, it means their view isn't right or something else is not right. There's, there's something off in their method, their approach to enlightenment. It shouldn't take much longer than a few weeks, actually, once you get everything lined up properly. And finally is Pachitam Veditabho Vinyahi. The wise individual can understand it directly, can realize it for himself. Okay, we don't have to rely on a teacher. It's nice if we have a qualified teacher. But if the teacher is not really enlightened, we won't be able to get it. It's better to go right back to the original suttas and read the Buddha's original words than to rely on a teacher who is not enlightened. Because if they haven't realized it, they're not going to be able to show us the way. Maybe we can come up to the level of, that they are on, but we can't go beyond that. So ultimately, we have to realize it for ourselves. And an intelligent person can do that simply by reading the Buddha's suttas, the Buddha's instructions to his monks. Now, one more thing I want to say, that with regard to enlightenment, Nibbana, the Tao, Samadhi, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> the state of no mind, no self, uh, that you can't describe it. As uh, Lao Tzu said, he who knows does not speak. He who speaks does not know. That doesn't mean that we just remain silent. No. What it means is we should understand that it is categorically impossible to describe enlightenment. You can't describe it in words. Let's be really clear about that right from the start. We're not going to attempt it even. <laughs> but what we are going to talk about is the way, how to realize it. Beginning with right view. And we've done a lot of work to build up that right view from the very first series on this site, on the uh, Dharmasar site, 
up until this final series on Nibbana. We've done a lot to build up the right view of the path. If you understand the terminology that we give in great detail in our series Existential Ambiguity, then when we use that terminology in this series, you'll immediately understand. If you haven't gone through that series, if you haven't gone through our series on how to teach yourself anything, uh, then you, you won't be able to get the full value from this series. So I'm urgently requesting you to go back, review those earlier series, and to understand our approach. Because that way, this one will go very smoothly and you'll be able to get the result. So, thank you very much for being with us. We're going to keep going on this series. There's a lot of uh, episodes that I want to get to. I'm still writing. I'm not that far ahead. So uh, it's going to be an interesting journey to see how we put all this material into the videos and get it across to people. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to write me. I'll go to our site and look at the other courses that are available. And please make them your own and get the benefits. Sabbe Satta Bhavantu Sukhi Tatta Bhavantu Sukhi Tatta